Uh, so this is really the core uh, mission of QCWare is to um, um, help essentially large corporates get ready um, with um, for quantum computing, right? And the potential disruption is going to bring in the different business processes. And we do that through two, um, essentially two different programs. One is our professional services engagements, right? So these will, uh, I'll talk about in just a second here. And the other is our software, right? So professional services and product. And I should also say, uh, you know, all the slides that I'll be presenting are, are really highlighting what we've done over the, over the past year, right? Um, so primarily in uh, over 2021. So let's get started. So the first story, Okay, if I can move to the next slide. Hold on, let's see here. It used to work here, let's see. Okay, let's, I'll do this. Okay, so uh, the first story is with uh, one of the largest uh, pharmaceutical companies. They're, um, um, uh, Boringer Ingelheim is not, uh, is not huge. I mean, they're not like in the top five in the pharma industry, but I think they're easily in the top 20. Um, they're out of Germany, uh, they're a big multinational. And if I'm not mistaken, they're, uh, they're a private pharmaceutical company. Uh, and they specialize in things like respiratory diseases, oncology, immunology, um, uh, those, those sort of things. And um, we started working with them uh, earlier in uh, 2021. Um, and uh, a few uh, weeks um, ago, we basically published a paper together. We put the paper on the archive. It's going through the peer review process. But the key use case around this is drug discovery, right? And the key thing um, that um, we did in this paper is we looked at how we can simulate large scale so that's important to get the, the, that part right. Large scale protein ligand interactions. And what that really means is that um, uh, protein ligand interactions are basically the interactions you, you want between the drugs, the potential drug, and the, uh, the protein in, in the human body so that the drug can be uh, very effective. And obviously, this is very technical, right? So I'm not going to, so this is the business track. So we're here to basically discuss at a high level uh, what are the different applications and where the field is going what, and what are some of the things we've done with customers. So I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, technical detail. I'm just going to peel the very, very first, very thin layer of the onion here. But the interesting thing is that we looked at um, a technique that uh, current computational chemists are using today to model these drug interactions. This is called SAPT, SAPT for short. And for those of you that want to know what the acronym means is symmetry, um, uh, symmetry uh, adjusted perturbation theory. Um, and maybe I got that wrong. Alicia, uh, maybe I got this wrong a little bit. But uh, the interesting thing is that this SAP method, obviously we use it on a classical computer, has certain limitations. And then uh, the point of this paper is to really see how we can run this on a, on a near-term quantum computer and get more accurate metrics to help the computational scientists do this, uh, uh, do this technique, right? Uh, so you can find this paper on, just like all our other papers on uh, QCWare, um, um, dot com slash research, uh, but I think it's, it's a very important study and, you know, we're very happy to have this partner uh, in crime in, in Boringer Ingelheim. So moving on, um, the next thing we announced again earlier this year, so this all this happened in 2021, as with Ross, Ross obviously is a, is a bigger name, so you probably know them, they're in top three in the pharma world. Um, and actually what we did with them was uh, this biomedical imaging uh, work. Again, the paper is on the archive now, we're going through the different processes to actually do the uh, peer review publication um, with them. And um, so what is interesting about this work is that it's using um, quantum neural nets to do essentially this um, detection of uh, issues basically on these, uh, on these uh, images that are coming from different patients. Um, and I'm just gonna, again, you know, just peeling the first layer of the onion here. Obviously, you know, these, uh, these topics again are kind of very technical and the papers go into a lot of detail, but the important um, result in this paper that we're uh, sharing is that we use these techniques that provide essentially a provable performance advantage over classical, specifically to train the classical neural net. So it's important to get this right, and I'm just gonna spend one more minute on it. So what we're doing is basically looking at a classical neural net, right, and are training it on the quantum computer, 
And the theory is telling us that this will be provably faster than training it on a GPU. Now, the other thing, that second uh, bullet point there is basically saying, well, we're also infusing some properties in the training of the neural net, some desirable properties, right? That you normally don't get when you actually train neural nets on GPUs. And these properties can help us in a number of different ways. One of them is um, interpretability. Um, the other is actually reducing the size, reducing the number of nodes or variables in the neural net. So we're, so we're getting some additional benefits. But the key uh, thing for, from a business perspective is that you can, uh, in the future, as quantum computers mature, you can actually reduce that running time and that training time for, the, um, um, for these classical neural nets. And uh, this work, actually, we also run it on IBM. So there's also some hardware results here on this work. Again, the paper is out on the archive and it's easy to find if you go to our, uh, if you go to our website. Okay. Um, another uh, big collaboration that we announced, we briefly talked about this collaboration back in 2020. So we started um, maybe around mid 2020, maybe I'm too close to, okay. I think that was or, me. That was Randy, okay, overall. So, uh, <laughs> so we uh, announced this collaboration with Covestro. We started working around mid uh, 2020. We talked about it in, the, in Q2B 2020, but there was, uh, we, we hadn't actually put anything out there. And by the way, there are some uh, empty seats here if you wanna uh, join us. Yeah, so no need to uh, be standing up and maybe there's a couple more here, yeah. Um, and um, we've now actually put two papers on the archive together with Covestro. So Covestro is a materials uh, company. They, um, they're also based in Germany and actually they're the spin-off from Bayer, right? So the Bayer materials division actually spun out into Covestro and uh, one of their businesses is basically creating these polyurethane uh, foams, uh, which uh, some of them are, are using these acoustic uh, panels, but actually they have a lot more applications, right? So they don't just do that. Um, they're a billion dollar company, so they do, uh, they do a lot of other things. Actually, this foam is used in cars and electronics and, you know, uh, everywhere. Uh, so um, and that's kind of the core part of their business. And obviously they have a, a large team uh, of uh, quantum scientists now that are looking into, okay, how do we do this uh, fundamental, essentially material design problem? How do we do that uh, with the help of the quantum computer? So as I mentioned, we um, published in the last few months, uh, two papers with them on the archive. Um, the first one uh, is aiming at reducing essentially the is, hardware is requirements no. needed to do yeah, this sorry. material design um, I think his mic is still on, by the way. Randy's mic is still on, so uh, if you want to mute that. Okay. So, we, uh, so the first one looks at how do we reduce basically the hardware requirements uh, to run um, some of these simulations, especially with uh, this technique called VQE that probably many of you are familiar with. How do we reduce the hardware requirements, uh, the depth of the circuit and the connectivity requirements so that we can uh, model even larger scale molecules uh, with uh, near-term hardware, right? So that was one of the key uh, results that's uh, shared in the paper. Um, the other key thing is that many of these VQE uh, simulations that have been proposed and are out there in the literature actually simulate some behaviors that cannot be found in nature. And you basically, uh, this is a bad thing. You don't want to be simulating things that your molecule cannot do. You want to be only simulating things that your molecule could do, right? So the paper concentrates on actually how do we get uh, this achieved? How do we essentially constrain the simulation model to just behave as a, as a regular system and actually produce these natural behaviors? And uh, the second paper that uh, the two teams co-authored, right? So in all these papers, the, the authors come from both our customer and the, the QCWare team. Um, <clears throat> So uh, the second paper talked about how do we go beyond this ground and excited state uh, simulation, right? So obviously ground and excited states are really important uh, for the molecules. They tell you basically, they tell the computational chemists that um, the molecule is gonna reach essentially this 
uh, state, um, this ground state, and this might be important for the measurement of some metric, right? I mean, how much light is being emitted from the molecule or, you know, its color or whatever, right? Whatever um, property we're, we're interested in. So, so measuring the ground in excited states is important, but actually knowing how do we get to the ground in excited states, what are the chemical reaction, what is the path needed to get there, that's going to help us essentially, and that's going to help the materials uh, people synthesize the molecule to get to that uh, to that desirable state. Uh, so that was the important. And those essentially those three bullet points are the are the important results that came out of the um, the work that we're doing with Covestro, and we're continuing uh, to work with them. Okay. So let me move on. Um, this. Um, Okay, uh, this next example, so I guess I forgot the animation here, no worries, you can start reading maybe. Uh, we've talked about a lot of uh, times about the work we've done with Goldman Sachs. So actually we announced uh, it for the first time back in uh, Q2B 2019, how we're working together, how we're working together on doing derivative pricing uh, with them. And, um, and actually back in uh, Q2B 2020, that's when our co-authored paper uh, came out and we discussed basically this new technique, uh, low depth amplitude estimation, to actually run these Monte Carlo simulations on, um, on near-term hardware, right? So, uh, so the algorithm to run this low, uh, this, um, sorry, this Monte Carlo simulation was known actually for quite some time, but the hardware requirements uh, for that would um, were maybe 20 years out, right? So we would need very large computers, very good fidelity, very large uh, number of qubits, and very good quality qubits. And the paper that came out back in, in 2020 basically reduced those hardware requirements. And actually, uh, Goldman, in one of the articles that was covered in the Financial Times, basically they, went, uh, they actually were quoted in saying that, well, now instead of w waiting 20 years before a quantum computing a quantum computer is ready to run this Monte Carlo simulation, maybe a quantum computer will be ready in five years to run this. Um, so that was the theory back in 2020. So the new thing this year was the hardware experiment that we did on IonQ. So basically kind of the theory and the hardware and everything came together and we were able to publish the results and basically on a real um, a quantum device. Now the IonQ computer actually we use for this experiment is not the one that's commercially available on Bracket. It was uh, their, um, their specialty hardware, um, but it kind of showed essentially the, the thing we were expecting to show. It basically showed what the theory is telling us about how these, um, these processes with derivative pricing are going to work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So let's move on. We've also talked uh, a number of times about our collaboration with the Aishin Group. So Aishin uh, is a Japanese company. They're a Toyota affiliate. And actually, they're the largest uh, transmission manufacturer in the world. And we've done uh, quite a lot of work with them uh, on a number of different use cases. So the one use case we, again, published the paper earlier this year was on vehicle routing. So very standard uh, supply chain management problem. You know, how do you send out the trucks basically, uh, which truck goes to which stop, and how do they come back to the depot, right? So it's a very, uh, very standard uh, problem in supply chain management. And uh, what we did was actually use um, uh, reinforcement learning techniques to solve this problem. And the interesting part was that we use classical RL with some quantum circuits to make these, um, these, these decisions with them. So we're going over the different projects we're, we're doing with uh, different customers. And um, we covered this, we covered Aishin, and we also announced uh, work we're doing with the Air Force Research Lab. Um, and the use case here was identifying these patterns, basically, of unmanned aircraft. Uh, for this work, we used uh, an algorithm that we had already developed and we had already published sometime um, in the past, it's called the Q-means algorithm. Effectively, it does the same thing as the K-means clustering algorithm, but it does it with quantum linear algebra. And why that is interesting is that this Q-means algorithm is provably faster on a quantum computer than it is on a classical computer. And when I say provably faster, what I mean is that you, know, you can count the steps, right? You can count the, the number of operations that's gonna take on the classical computer, you can count the number of operations that it's gonna take on the quantum computer, and these number of steps is lower. 
Um, now, obviously, because of the state of hardware, we can still not run this on a big enough problem size where we can actually see um, how much faster it is. But uh, knowing what the number of steps is in both cases gives us, gives us actually all the confidence we need in saying that this will be faster when the hardware gets there. Um, and just to give you another example of how much faster this is, so it really depends on the dimensionality of the data set. So this is a little bit small there, the font is a little bit small, but basically uh, what it's saying is that for 64 dimensions with this Q-means algorithm, you can get a 10x uh, speed up on the quantum computer versus the classical uh, computer. And as the number of dimensions grow, you can actually get an even bigger speed up. So that's, that's where uh, the power of quantum computing will really shine. Uh, you get the, this um, smooth scaling of the computational power needed, whereas on the classical side, you have a very steep uh, scaling of, of uh, the, uh, the computational steps needed. So, um, and, and that's why uh, quantum in these cases, uh, we know for a fact will actually uh, shine and will provide uh, faster results. Okay, so as I said, this is uh, what we did on the professional services side, um, but there are actually many other things we're doing that are currently in flight uh, that I'm, we're hoping to announce in uh, 2022. So we have uh, an ongoing uh, project with uh, the retail bank where we're doing uh, essentially a retail bank specific uh, use case. Um, we have one, we actually have two different automotive projects that are currently in flight that we hope to, again, talk to, um, to you uh, very soon in uh, 2022. And we also are doing um, this uh, project on, in the energy space that, um, again, we're hoping in 2022 we'll be able to share uh, more details. So unfortunately, yeah, it takes some time after the project is done to convince communications departments and everything to, you know, put uh, press statements out and everything. So with that, um, I also want to share a little bit about what these projects actually look like, right? So we saw kind of the end result, but I want to take you through a little bit of the journey of what happens during the different stages of these projects. So um, what we call a standard uh, project includes the following steps. So you start with uh, some use case definition where you understand the use case in more detail, you bring in data or you define a synthetic data set. Then in the standard project, you map the uh, use case and the problem and the data you got to a form that can run on a quantum algorithm. Then you do this execution on either simulations or, or simulators or real hardware, and then you report on the results. So on this uh, shorter term project, this standard project, the focus is really on these to uh, middle steps, right? Doing the ma mapping of the data into, as I said, a form that can go into the quantum computer and then doing the execution either on different hardware types or, or simulators. Um, the more advanced uh, projects actually have slightly different uh, steps. Uh, so you still obviously need to understand the use case and you still need to kind of get the data uh, from the customer. Uh, you still need to do this modeling but then the key thing that happens afterwards is to basically figure out um, how can we push the envelope on what is known on the algorithmic side and how do we essentially define a new algorithm that can um, solve this problem better, right? So this algorithmic definition step is actually a research step. It can take a long time. That's where, you know, uh, having the help of, of the customers come in, we work with them um, and their people and, uh, and essentially define uh, these more um, um, advanced algorithms. And, and that's where the papers come from because the papers, obviously, you need kind of unique and, and new um, uh, information to share uh, in the papers. Um, and finally, we, in some cases, we do some execution and analysis and then kind of the final report, which could be a published paper or patent or, or, uh, or all of the above, effectively. Okay. Uh, so in this case, the, the project focus is basically on this algorithmic definition execution steps. Um, that's really where, where we concentrate. Now, one other thing I'm going to show really quickly is uh, kind of what we've done in terms of all the research that we've done in uh, the last year. And the reason for doing this is not, not you know, just to share uh, the research. I mean, this is kind of all the work we're doing so that we're ready and we can better advise customers 
of you know what are the new use cases, what are the latest algorithms that uh, uh, someone could be um, could be using for different use cases. So this is research we do for and with customers and partners, and these are essentially all the papers that we put out in in 2021. Again, really the best ways to uh, go to to the website and you know um, uh, see in the website basically. Uh, in these different areas, machine learning optimization, chemistry simulation, what we've uh, put out there with our partners and customers. Uh, so the last part of, the of, of my presentation, I just have two or three slides to show the software side, right? So what do we do? Uh, how our software essentially, again, helps the customer get ready for quantum computing disruption. <clears throat> So this is essentially our entire stack of our product called QCWare Forge, right? So everything you see here is implemented in Forge. So uh, we implement these very unique applications and algorithms that in many cases, as you just saw, uh, came out of these project engagements, right? So we do the project, we find something new with the customer, something that the customer is interested in and something that where we can um, uh, figure out some, some new technique, and then we distill that uh, new knowledge, that new research into the product. Really, that's our, our business model uh, at QCWare. Uh, so the two things, the professional services side and the software side essentially work uh, hand in hand. And um, what I'm gonna do now is essentially draw this box, and the reason I'm drawing this box is not to say that, um, is to say that this is basically the unique and the differentiating part of QCWare and specifically QCWare Forge. Basically, it's this application layer. Everything else you see here, yes, is implemented in Forge, right? So a customer going in can use our binary optimization proprietary algorithm. They'll go through some middleware, they'll go to our partners in bar bracket, and then they'll go to our partners in the hardware side. But the rest of the stack on, from the middleware going down is something that essentially is out there um, for, for everyone to use or a, a lot of other vendors are also, you know, have the rest of the stack. The unique piece is basically that algorithmic piece that we get through these research engagements that we do. Um, and specifically, I want to highlight that within 2021, we added two of these blue boxes at that top level of the stack, right? So within 2021, we announced this linear algebra API, right? How do you do linear algebra on a quantum computer? Actually, if you were in the uh, um, keynote room earlier today, you heard from Jean-Francois from BCG saying, really the big thing that quantum computers are good at are these sparse matrix algebra, right? Um, and this is exactly what we're doing now with this linear algebra API. We basically have techniques that allow us to do things like uh, distance calculations or matrix multiplications on the quantum computing with as near term circuits as, as possible, basically. Like, so very short circuits and very few qubits that can run uh, on near term uh, devices. So this is all near term, not fault tolerant um, theory. And the other thing that basically we're just talking about it today for the very, very first time is to say that this work that we did with Goldman on the Monte Carlo um, simulation, we now have put into uh, the product. And in fact, actually, if you switch tracks, uh, if you go to the demo track uh, later in the afternoon, uh, some of my colleagues, Son Weinberg and Sohum Takar will be giving a demo on uh, these two pieces, the linear algebra piece and the Monte Carlo piece. But this is the first time basically we're, we're again making the result of the professional services engagement um, be part of the, of the product. <clears throat> uh, just wanna highlight one quick thing and uh, I think I'm gonna pass it on to the next speaker. I have a couple more minutes. So we address with um, Forge two types of users. The one type are the data scientists, the guys that actually don't know quantum computing, don't know how to build quantum circuits, and possibly don't really care to uh, learn that, right? Um, and for those um, users, we give them these turnkey algorithmic implementations, things like, okay, here's a, a way to uh, do classification. Here's another way to do clustering, right? And this is very typical for essentially the user experience and the workflow for data scientists. So data scientists, you know, when they 
again, uh, gather all the data to solve a problem, they don't go up and code a classification method. They go to their favorite algorithmic library and say, okay, just run this data against you know, this one, two, three, however many different classification schemes, and I'm gonna you know, check the results and see which of the results actually are to my liking. So we're essentially replicating the same workflow here where we're saying the data scientist only really cares and worries about the data and the, um, uh, the structure of the data and wrangling uh, the data, and then they don't really care about how the execution do is done under the hood. So that's the one type of user we're, uh, we're covering. The other type of user are the quantum engineers that actually do want to essentially see how the sausage is made and look under the hood with all the wiring. And for that type of user, what we're offering are these circuit building blocks, right? Circuits we've already discovered with, um, in our uh, different research engagements, right? So, so some of the linear algebra circuits, some of the Monte Carlo circuits that we already um, have built. And uh, the quantum, quantum engineers that actually know how to synthesize quantum circuits can reuse, right? So for example, this distance estimation circuit, right? I mean, distance estimation is like a fundamental part in many, many different algorithms in order to do any kind of similarity learning. Um, anything in QML really is based on essentially measuring distances in multidimensional vectors. So doing that efficiently can be really at the core of pretty much all these, all these approaches. Uh, so we have some roadmap items that I wanted to share. Uh, so we're going to uh, inject into the product this new work we did on quantum neural nets. Um, we have some new things coming in linear algebra. We have new things coming in optimization and chemistry simulation. And um, I'm just going to wrap it up here to uh, give the rest of the speakers enough time. Maybe I have time for one question. Thank you. Um, good point. So, so the, I think the question is, um, that's fine. I think you already asked it. Okay, I'll repeat it. All right. So I think your question is whether the circuit building blocks are done in such a way that uh, whether the user can build their own and then do anything they want with it. So, uh, so here's the thing. So uh, when you buy a license for Forge, that gives you the, um, um, the benefit of basically creating any number of circuits. And then, yes, you can use those circuits to do anything you want. Now, you can put the circuit, right? Uh, pretty much anywhere you can it, you own it right I mean we after we create it for you then you own that circuit you can actually easily translate it to Qiskit and circ and other things and kind of use it and execute it exactly yes you can build your own circuit yeah You can publish that circuit on papers and anywhere you want to publish it. Yeah, you own that circuit once it's built, but uh, we own the technique, obviously. You own the end product, which is the specific circuit for that specific. Do we market other people's circuits? Interesting. No, this is uh, this is not something really we've considered in our in our business model, right? So uh, we we don't really have a marketplace to speak of, right? But I guess you know if I if I go if I take it slightly different, your question, then we're not really the, here to just essentially promote our proprietary stuff. If we see something else in the literature that is interesting, then we might actually build that and offer it through Forge. But I don't see us as necessarily doing kind of this marketplace dynamic where anyone kind of put their different techniques in different circuits and then others can, can buy. Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's maybe actually move on to the next speaker and then uh, I'm happy to, to take things offline. I'm happy to take other questions offline um, throughout the conference. Thank you.